it's hard to identify because my mom was good, nice mom. So uh, grateful for Donna this morning. Just pray she'll get feeling better. Grateful to have her still with us. For Ryan's dad, John, just heal his body and uh, thank you. He's still here. And Ryan's able to come and be with us. For the Lee kids as they go over to Camp Spot for this summer, just have a ministry. Uh, and all the camps are going on with Mike uh, and all of us trying to do with uh, see Rachel coming next weekend to talk a little bit with us about uh, what Child Evangelism Fellowship does <coughs> this summer. And we just want to commit our summer to you, all of us. And it's, uh, it's easy to be silent, Lord. It's easy to treasure what we have and keep it kind of under a bushel. But it's hard to be a repeater. I was thinking about that this morning, just uh, all the different radio channels that are repeater stations. And we don't have to come up with anything new. All we got to do is repeat what we already know to people. Just give us a little more courage. In the summertime, we're out around more people, the lakes and who knows where, just uh, that we'd be willing to just uh, step out of our comfort zone and maybe share the gospel with someone. We thank you for this fellowship and the blessing it is to be uh, together today. We commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so I've got to have a couple more and just make sure you're awake. <laughs> but the Sunday school teacher said, uh, Johnny, do you say your prayers before you eat? He said, no, ma'am, I don't have to. My mom's a good cook. <laughs> <laughs> and Ryan said uh, to uh, little Johnny, why did you chop the joke book in half? And Johnny said, my mom said to cut the comedy. <laughs> you heard that one already. <laughs> Took a slice out of that punchline. <laughs> uh, what the, oh. uh, the elephant said, uh, why do mother kangaroos hate rainy days? And the hippo said, I give up. The elephant says, because the kids have to play inside. <laughs> <laughs> a mother mouse and a baby mouse are walking down this road and when suddenly a cat attacks them, the mother mouse shouts, back, and the cat run, takes off, runs away. See, the mother mouse says to her baby, now you see why it's important to learn a foreign language? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll, just come, I'll, I won't bore you with any more. <laughs> what did the digital clock say to its mother? Look, ma, no hands. <laughs> All right, we'll be Let's go to uh, Romans chapter 5. We're going from something to something. Let's go. 
you know what the real second wife this is? See, how about Newton? How to keep the kids quiet? You want us to keep calling out letters in the... Well, you know, if, you, if you can solve the first two words, go ahead and I heard solve. somebody over here say something. But, and well, it sounds like... What is it? Standing something. Standing Stale, but that doesn't make sense. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I standing, and it, it isn't a sentence. Okay, maybe that's what confused you. We're going to transfer now in Romans. Now I'm not talking about the Hampton Vermont, but I condition. Okay, I standing with God is that we have, we're going to see, we have
Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. This is the first mention in Paul's epistle of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 5, before he talks about the Holy Spirit. That's something. So we're going to see, you're going to have some things. When it comes to, uh, i got to remember what these words were. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, okay. to God, we have acceptance, we've been accepted, we've been reconciled to God as a result of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. The penalty, the wrath has been removed. Galatians, see, Ephesians says, you who were by nature children of wrath, even as others, he has saved, you know, by grace, are you saved through faith. It's the, the lights come on. But we're going to now deal with Peace with God, verse 1 of chapter 5. 
And through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace where we stand. And But now when He transitions into the process that begins. Through Him we have been obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Okay? Knowing that Anybody else have a different translation? Anyone have the translation that says tribulation? The old King James said tribulation. And uh, I'm not sure what the NIV says. But you're going to see a process here. What, this is kind of like this thing where one leads to the other, leads to the other, leads to the other. And you have here, uh, so... Suffering produces endurance. See it? And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. It's like God plucked us off the out of the mass of mankind. That's what the word sanctify actually means. Set apart. I mean, he pulls, pulls you out of the mass of mankind and says, I'm going to make something out of you. And it's got nothing to do with you. I'm doing it. Remember last week, the unconditional covenant, where Abraham cut the covenant that was unconditional, he was fast asleep. Really, too, you understand the scripture, what it seems to say, that God has some people that are his, and he pulls them out of the rest, and sets them on a shelf, and says, okay, bud, you're mine now, and I'm going to change you. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. And it's one, one, uh, it's tribulation, is produces perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. That's in the New King James. The SV, suffering, endurance, character, hope, this process. But one uh, commentator, I, I like what he had to say. It's melting, mellowing, molding, and maturing. Okay? Anyone here know how they refine metals? What do they do? Extremely hot fire. They refine that it's called the it not only melting but S in front of it, smelting, right? You you heat them up and the dross comes off the top. It's like this whole concept of God melts us. Anyone agree with that? Mm -hmm. You have anything going on in your life that uh, makes you kind of sick of yourself? <laughs> All the time, right? Melting, mellowing, molding, maturing. Amazing. Go down to verse, uh, verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. You could ask yourself a question, and you may ask yourself a question, how much does God love me? How do you know how much He loved you? He talks about it right here in this section. While we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the good people. No, the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. You get the kid this week that went in and tackled that shooter, the high school kid, and saved everybody else, jumped on him and at his funeral. I mean, that's, you know, it takes a lot of guts just to do that. But God shows his love for us, or demonstrates, verse 8, <clears throat> demonstrates his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Galatians 2, 20, I am crucified with Christ, and nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. He demonstrated his love for us. Since therefore, verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Yeah. 
Reconciliation. That's a beautiful, beautiful word. Got a couple ideas about reconciliation. Looking up, uh, the Civil War was a mess, a carnage. Jefferson Davis of the Confederate <coughs> Army died, and Ulysses Grant of the Union Army died. They're widows. Verena Davis and Julia Grant settled near each other. And guess what? They became best friends. Yeah. Isn't that something? Talk about reconciliation. One New Year's Eve at, uh, at a London's Garrett Club, British dramatist Frederick Lonsdale was asked by Seymour Hicks to reconcile with a fellow member. The two had quarreled in the past and never restored their friendship. You've got to, Hicks says to Lonsdale, it's, it's, it's very unkind to be unfriendly at such a time as this. Go over there now and wish him a happy new year. So Lonsdale crossed the room and spoke to his enemy. I wish you a happy new year, he said, but only one. <laughs> Uh, a childhood accident caused poet Elizabeth Barrett to lead a life of semi-invalidism. I guess it's Elizabeth Barrett Brown. Um, she was an invalid. She married Robert Browning in 18, yes. In 1846, she married Robert Browning. There's more to the story. In her youth, she'd been watched over by her tyrannical father. When she and Robert were married, their wedding was held in secret because of her father's disapproval. After the wedding, the Brownings sailed for Italy, where they lived for the rest of their lives. But even though her parents had disowned her, Elizabeth never gave up on their relationship. And almost weekly, she wrote them letters. Not once did they reply. After 10 years, she received a large box in the mail. Inside, Elizabeth found all of her letters. Not one had been opened. Today, those letters are among the most beautiful and classic English literature. Had her parents only read a few of them, their relationship with Elizabeth might have been restored. That's something. And St. Clement of Alexandria said this, For the sake of each of us, he laid down his life, worth no less than the universe. He demands of us in return our lives for the sake of each other. Right? Be reconciled to one another. Quite something. Go down now to verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Now admittedly, if you read this, this is confusing and a little bit hard to understand, you say? Why did something Adam do affect me? Right? But the scripture tells us that that's the case. They've come up with several views. One is called the federal headship theory where Adam was the representative man of all that. And I've always thought of it this way, it might not be right, so don't quote this one. But I've always thought, if it hadn't been Adam, if it had been me, I probably would have done the same thing, possibly. But anyway, when Adam sinned, something happened to the whole human race. The, and the free gift, uh, excuse me, Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. 
For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for how many? All men. At least all that are willing, right? For as by the one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Anyone here uh, know a hymn called Hark the Herald Angels Sing? <laughs> when I first got saved, got saved in January, so it was like a whole year before we sang Christmas carols again. When it came around to singing Christmas carols, when they started singing Hark the Herald Angels Sing, I got into it about three words and I couldn't, I just couldn't, I just started crying. Yeah. One of the things says, Adam's likeness now efface, stamp thine image in its place. That's one of the, it's like, whoa, this is the theology of all saying, you know. And that's what was going on. One man's sin had consequences. We're going to sing a final song today uh, called, what's the name of that song? Jesus, thank you. And it's talking about uh, once an enemy, now seated at your table. You know where that comes from? Would you go with me to uh, the Old Testament? Second uh, Samuel 9. I talked in previous messages about the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. All the way through the Old Testament is these pictures of things that are pointing ahead to a huge truth that's going to be revealed in the New Testament. And 2 Samuel 9 is a beautiful picture of this. David's become king. Who was the king before David? Remember his name? He was tall, dark, and handsome, and did tremendous, had tremendous exploits. <laughs> and uh, you got me going. <laughs> I go tall, dark, handsome, bundles. <laughs> got the handsome guy right there. <laughs> uh, anyway, he. Uh, Remember, he's, he's given some direct instructions to go and kill all the Amalekites and all the animals, all the sheep and everything. But he doesn't do it. And Nathan comes to him and says, uh, have you done what God told you to do, what the prophet told you to do? He says, oh yeah, we've done it all. He says, well, then what means the, this bleeding of sheep in that I hear in my ears? And he also kept the king alive. And he, he ended up, that's basically the beginning of the end of his reign. He tries to kill David. I mean, he's, he's David's enemy all the time. But you know what they did when, uh, when a different family took over in, and became king in that culture? You know what they did with the family of the old king? They killed them all. Even Queen Athaliah, who is the granddaughter of Ahab, I believe, killed all of her own children and grandchildren. Check it out. You know, that's something. Usurp the throne, she wanted to be secure in her queenship, and she killed her own children and her own grandchildren. Okay, so anyway, Saul has this son, and when news comes that Saul and Jonathan have been killed in battle, Ziba, Z I B A, however you pronounce her name, she's the caretaker of Mephibosheth, and he's just a young boy. And she takes off running, thinking they're going to come and kill all the rest of the, the sons of the king. And she drops Mephibosheth. Say that five times, please, okay? <laughs> she drops Mephibosheth, and it cripples him in his feet. They didn't have uh, Dr. Hitchcock back then. They didn't have metaphorites. 
and he was crippled the rest of his life. Okay? So here, that sets the context. He's this crippled boy, son of Saul. Excuse me, grandson of Saul, son of Jonathan. Jonathan's son. And remember, David was best friend with Jonathan before he died. So David says in chapter 9, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, I use Ziba, and he said, I'm your servant. And the king said, Is this not still someone of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God to him? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He's crippled in his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? And he says to the king, he's in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and paid homage. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David says to him, What? Don't be afraid. I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. And I will restore you all the land of Saul, your father. I'd like to have you, if you believe in underlining your Bibles, or if you have an electronic one, highlight it. Look at all the things that, that I've given to Mephibosheth. First of all, he's not in trouble. Do not fear. I'm going to show you kindness for your father's sake, Jonathan. I'm going to restore you to you all the land of Saul, your father. And you shall eat at my table always. <coughs> now, the, what we're going to say, he says, once an enemy, now seated at your table. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, okay? You shall leave my table all. And he paid homage and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? <coughs> Then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him. They're even going to see this. They're going to even till the land for him. And they're going to bring in the produce that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. And he said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. What's he pointing to? You and I were crippled by a fall. The fall of Adam. Adam fell, and it brought us all into death, right? Children of wrath, even as others. The, the curse that came on the planet, came on the human race. You and I, I thought about in this, in pointing to the fact. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who lived at Zebra's house became Mephibosheth's servants. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, and ate always at the king's table, even though he was lame in both his feet. When we sing that uh, the fall of Adam was not just the fall of a man, but the Greek word is anthropos. It means, it can mean, does mean people of both sexes. In Hebrew, it's Adam that fell. Ish is a boy in Hebrew, Isha is a girl in Hebrew. Man, man sinned, man fell. You see what I mean? So that when Adam sinned, it had consequences on the race. And that, you and I, participate in the consequences of the fall. But when we come into a relationship with the Son of God, we get brought into the place where we're seated at His table with all the rights and privileges. It's amazing. He, he was provided for. Everything was taken care of. And God cares for you in the same way when you come to know Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for scripture. Um, we don't come up with this stuff. It's 
been handed down from generation to generation as we've studied the scripture and just see this beautiful truth portrayed throughout all of Paul's writings and just opening up things and just the hints of it all in the Old Testament. We're grateful. Grateful that Jesus died for us. And we can be brought into a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And spiritually speaking, we can sit at His table and feed and be secure and be taken care of because of what Christ did. God demonstrated His love to us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you in Jesus' name.